have landed on episode number 137 of eBay the right way. Today's date is November 1st, 2023, and my guest is Melissa in Texas. Announcements. I haven't given you an update since this summer on the new material added to the premium library. Yes, I still add content every single week. So here is a rapid fire list of what has been added over the last few months. And I'm going in some new directions with the content. So listen up because there might be something that appeals to you. There is a new section highlighting artists and their work. This is something I am learning, not just signed numbered art, but all sorts of items. And I will be aggressively building this section going forward because I'm seeing a lot of items posted on the Money Making Mondays by artists. And I will admit, I don't know a lot about this category, so we're going to learn it together. Okay, I added a brand spotlight about a vintage clothing item that has resurfaced and is highly sought after. I added eight bulletins. That's where I'm on camera talking to you, giving you an update about various things in the eBay community, and also it includes a newly discovered bolo, an item to be on the lookout for. I post two of these a month, and this alone is worth the investment of a membership. You just don't know what you don't know, and I'm in that group too. And you may not be as plugged in to the eBay community as I am. I research and record new information about bolos every day just by paying attention. So I am your personal researcher and so you can check those bolos for what I'm out there learning. Collectibles, another category I am diligently learning and sharing with you. Three new lessons there. Ephemera or paper stuff. This is just fascinating to learn how much people will pay for what looks like trash. <laughs> there are two new lessons there. Another lesson in the golf shirt course. Three new keyword lessons helping you speak the buyer's language so they can find your listings. This is crucial to being found in search. There are a total of 35 keyword lessons now, and these help you up your title writing game on eBay. This is a great resource if you have trouble crafting titles or knowing the most recent lingo. You've got to speak the buyer's language so they can find you. Another lesson in the plush course, I continually build on this section and it has 14 lessons now. And all of my lessons are usually less than 15 minutes long. I create these knowing that your time is valuable. I get to the point, show you what you need to know, what you need to look for, what things are selling for. So these don't drag on and on. They're short, sweet, and to the point by design. Okay, there are two new Q&A podcasts. These are audio files so you can listen while you work. And the premium library is my gold standard of educational materials for eBay sellers. I am passionate about helping other sellers learn and find success on eBay because we can all be successful. It's not a competition. There are now a total of 545 lessons, adding up to 131 hours of education, along with materials such as flowcharts and cheat sheets that you can download. You can download anything you want and keep it forever. That's by design. 
and you receive the help desk service directly with me via email, I do not outsource that because I want to help you directly and I want to make sure you're getting the right answer. My guarantee is that I answer within 24 hours, usually much less. So there you go. That's what I've been doing in the background to help everyone learn more and ultimately make more money on eBay. If you haven't checked out the premium library or maybe you've been away, I encourage you to try it for a month so you can see everything for yourself. Okay, commercial over. <laughs> now for the conversation with Melissa. Welcome back, listeners. I have a repeat offender on the Money Making Monday thread with us, uh, Melissa. Um, she's been posting a lot of cool stuff. So it's her turn to be a victim on my podcast. <laughs> hey. <laughs> How are you doing this morning, Melissa? I'm doing great. Okay. And where are you located? I am located in South Texas, right on the border of Mexico. Oh, that's yes. interesting. <laughs> so do you take advantage of that location to run over to Mexico for little weekend getaways and stuff? Absolutely not. <laughs> oh, you don't? It's, okay. No, 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 no. It's a little too dangerous for that. Okay. Um, unless, unless I had family or something like that over there um but yes it's it's a, not a great not a great, not a great place to run at no, the if moment. I want to go to Mexico I'm going to fly to some place with white sandy beaches okay okay and you know what that brings to mind is I got involved in the show called to catch a smuggler have you ever seen that I don't think so. well have I seen it I mean, I've seen to catch a killer, but I think it's older, but you know how you, you watch something and then your streaming service is like, you may also like this. Yes. So I, I always give it a book. try. And sometimes <laughs> I do. And sometimes I'm like, why did you suggest that? But, um, I just don't know. I may have seen it, but I just, I don't know. So what I was fascinated with, there were several episodes about smuggling stuff across the Mexican border. And it wasn't just drugs. It was all kinds of things, money and people and weapons. And um, they show them taking apart the cars at the border mm -hmm. like for they're suspicious of something. They, I mean, and they can do it so fast. I was just amazed at how they take everything apart and though they find any little void that could be filled with something. And um, yeah, that was that was really interesting. Um, I've never driven across the border, so I don't know anything about it, but I was like, yeah, they have a lot of uh, technology, cameras and body cams and all kinds of neat stuff. I've actually been in the, you know, to see when they go through the checkpoints and stuff, I've I've been shown some different equipment and stuff. So it's pretty cool what they find yeah, and, and, and they pretty have, scary at the same time. And they have the dogs and the dogs are never wrong. <coughs> um, no. <laughs> and, but it was just fascinating how they do it. And, you know, I just don't think like a criminal. I'm like, oh, I never would have thought of that. I never would have thought of putting a human in there, you know, and, and all that stuff they do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's also very scary and you know for the for those that they're smuggling over to it's um absolutely yeah very 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 dangerous yes so anyway um I feel you on that not wanting to drive across no fly in, fly in <laughs> not me. Acapulco or Cancun or something yeah. <laughs> so, okay so we got that out of the way um so yeah, I, I picked on you. Um, I saw you on the Money Making Mondays a few times. And um, how did you get started with eBay? When did that happen? Well, do you want me to start recently or like originally? Oh, let's hear the whole story. Okay. <laughs> okay we have time. So, okay, cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, I first got started. I, I had looked it up. I joined in 1998. 
And so it was right at the beginning. And I heard about it through my brother and my sister-in-law. And she, they got started through her sister. And so they used to come over every year. We lived a few hours apart, but they would come for Thanksgiving. And so they were busy uh, loading up stuff on the computer. And, you know, and this was back before we had the laptops and stuff. So they were on my computer checking on things and showing me all the ropes. So, uh, that's why I got started. It's the first time I had ever seen a digital camera. I'd never heard of them before, mm -hmm. but she had, she had one and hers, I thought it took pretty good pictures. I was pretty impressed. She had purchased it from her sister because her sister got a fancier one. And so that's kind of how I was introduced to eBay. And I didn't start out by buying. I was, I started, I was going to sell first before I took a chance on buying. And you didn't even have to take pictures. So my first item I sold did not even have a photo. And I sold, I remember what it was. It was a pair of uh, my husband's white Levi jeans because I bought them for him and he was not into colored jeans. <laughs> so I, I sold them. I described them. You had to have really great descriptions. Someone bought it. They sent me a money order. <laughs> And I took it down to the post office and sent it on its merry way. And that was my very first thing that I sold. I, I didn't start selling to really make money, except maybe a little extra here or there. And after that, I started buying for the kids. At the time, I was into Gymboree and Gap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought that was <laughs> really fancy clothes for my kids at the time, but I wasn't about to pay full price when they grew up. Oh so. gosh, I don't know who could afford <laughs> the Jimbery stuff, right? right? Store. Um, well, I mean, I know people that did, but it was like, I can't even justify spending that much on myself for clothing. No, no. So I, the kids had a great wardrobe and my daughter was all, I still look at her pictures and her cute little Jimbery or, or even her Oshkosh outfits and stuff. And I'm like, oh, I got that on eBay. <laughs> right, right. So that's kind of how I got started buying. And then every once in a while, I would go to the store and I would see things on clearance for really cheap. And I would think, oh, I could sell that on eBay. <laughs> uh -huh. So I, and that was only auctions back then. Right. And it was, it's so, like, your worlds collide when you start thinking with your eBay brain and put on your eBay glasses. It's like, oh, I could take this thing from over here and sell it on eBay. Over right. Here. And yeah, I had never heard the term retail arbitrage. That's kind of a newer term. Yeah, that, that kind of I was started. introduced around maybe 2010 when people started really uh, doing that for Amazon. Okay. You know, like the Tickle Me Elmo and all the the toy oh yeah we have we still have the original <laughs> oh really oh yeah my son yeah, my so mother-in-law like the... my mother-in-law is one of those people she has to be the first to get something so my son got tickle me elmo the the year that chaos erupted yeah and that was that started a trend like every year was a few hard to find christmas toys and people would go to toys r us and walmart and buy them all up Right. <laughs> wait for the prices to go up online and then sell them for three times what you paid. So listeners, that doesn't really work anymore because we've got so many people trying to do it. That was a new concept. And you've got the stores limiting what you can buy, like how many you can buy. Right. Like you can't buy 20. And back then they didn't really have a much of a return policy that was just on the individual person and now I think probably after Christmas the parents are going to go scoop up <laughs> ones they find on sale and and send back the old ones find something wrong with it or something yeah, so that's that, the, that the scares Christmas, me a little bit the Christmas switcheroo where they just get it at whatever price online so they their kid can unwrap it on Christmas right. morning and then in January when the market settles out and the prices go down they they return one the one expensive one they bought online and just go get one locally and it's called returnuary for a reason <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, so I would I would find some items. And one thing that I didn't understand was, you know, now with the buy it now, we just leave it and kind of forget it for a while. But then, you know, we had the, I don't know how, we had the seven day auction was the one that I always use, but it, it didn't have a bid in seven days. I was so disappointed because I had, you had to pay fees to relist. They didn't have the store and all that right. stuff, special prices. So anytime you would see that, that green, <laughs> I remember seeing the, the green um, sales that, oh, you got a bid and mm -hmm. that was pretty exciting. And then if it didn't, I would think, oh, there's something wrong with the product, you know, not, right. not really understanding all the algorithms and all the stuff that, that goes into it. So that was kind of my first foray into the world of eBay. And then I also found another auction place. I don't know if you, do you remember Yahoo auctions back then? Yes, I do. Did you ever? <laughs> it was a very similar format. So when eBay started getting big and, you know, there's a lot more competition, I started listing stuff on Yahoo auctions. And I actually, I sold a lot on that one because there was, it maybe didn't sell for as much as it would have on eBay, but there were more, there were less buyers. So there were more um, potential customers, I guess. Like right. the pool was smaller. Right. And so I started doing that for a while and then eventually that just faded out. And then Every once in a while, I would sell something like maybe an old phone or, you know, an old something that I thought was worth something. And but I never did it really for profit. It was more just for fun and to get a little extra change here and there. OK, so that's so you weren't like a diehard seller doing it for income. You were just rehoming stuff that you didn't need anymore. Yeah, just rehoming stuff or stuff that I would find really great deals on to flip. Well, and I have also, to um, commend you real quick. I always look at the background and you're you're in your eBay office, it looks like. And you oh. cube <laughs> I storage. Have it learned. <laughs> Is that cube storage back there? Yes. And that's just it's so neat. It's like so I don't I don't see any stuff. Everything is tucked away. Your shipping supplies are neatly stacked. It looks like you're white background is oh those are extra yeah those are extra yeah and it's just like wow that is you get a prize gold star for I'm, neatest office <laughs> yeah i'm very i i love organizing it's so oh, it's, you got a shoe you want to see like <laughs> oh yeah. look at her now most of that is not she has an entire wall, maybe like, I don't know, 10 feet long of cube storage. And then the closet, well, the clo I have a, another closet back there with larger and What's in your shoe um, organizer hanging over the door? Is that shoes or just supplies? No, actually that was just, uh, my. this was my daughter's room before she moved out. So that um, that was her shoe rack. And now it holds small stuff, like small Christmas ornaments and things like that. It, I find that it's safer from me there than it is in a box <laughs> because yeah. I I have to admit I have a couple of times broke things as I pulled it out to sell it so oh yeah we've all done that very disheartening so I just wanted to commend you on um how neat your office is and good for you yes so, thank you okay. <laughs> Back to, back to whatever yeah. I interrupted you from. <laughs> oh, no. So I was just telling my eBay story. And in the meantime, I have my brother and my sister-in-law who are, they were, it was not their business, but they sold a lot of stuff on eBay. They were always just through the years, you know, they had their eBay credit card and they were just, they, they did a lot of eBay. In fact, I, they bought up the whole bridal shop once. Uh, I, I think the dresses had kind of gone out of style. So they had a little bit of a tough time with that. But so I always had them in the back of my ear. And then my brother, eventually, he actually started selling full time on eBay. And he still does to this day. So he started several years ago. And he still does it full time. So I guess it kind of runs in the family. <laughs> yeah, I guess you have it in your DNA. And it's genetic. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. And he switched a lot over to Amazon, not, not so much because he wanted to, but because that's kind of where the market was going. And he, he does both now. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how I, I started with eBay. And then I kind of let it go for a long time, you know, other than just selling things here or there. One thing I did find out was that when you try to sell your own phones, all the scammers come out of the woodwork. I don't think I've, I mean, and they were just my old phones. And I don't think I had a single phone that I've listed that didn't have some scams running. Yeah, so, that's just a magnet for scammers. And yes, so I, I am why they're so attracted to them. I mean, not the all phones work <laughs> a lot, but yeah. And so what kind of um what kind of questions would you get? Like what tipped you off that this is a scammer? Well, like one of them was well, for one, people would bid because at the time I was still doing bids, even though like I want to say in the mid, I don't know. 2012, 2015, somewhere in that area, era. And I know there was buy it now, but I was still old, old school. <laughs> I didn't really, I purchased buy it now, but I really wasn't comfortable with selling buy it now because I never had done it. Um, so I would have it on auction and I would always get bids, but it would be the, the winning bid would be the person that didn't have any feedback and they'd be from a different country. Like Timbuktu somewhere mm -hmm. and they wouldn't purchase it and I kind I, I found out I believe what was happening some of them were running it up because they were competitors and so they didn't want mine selling okay. <laughs> so they were just stringing me along and I had several like that mm -hmm. and so that's when I thought you know what I, I definitely am not really interested in electronics, maybe small ones here and there, but the phones, no, because it happened more than once. So I now have a bunch of phones that, you know, are in my collection, <laughs> my old phones. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I, and it was every single one, every single one was from a different country with zero feedback, which I have buyers with zero feedback and from different countries, but then they wouldn't pay, but it, it just, the questions that would come were just strange. They would message strange things. So mm -hmm. no more. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of how we decide what we want to sell and what we don't want to mess with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, electronics, unless you know what you're doing and you know all the parts are there and it works right, because what happened to me was I did try that on a few different things and um, I didn't really know a lot about what I was selling, <laughs> live and learn. And I would get, you know, I would sell it and then the buyer would say, oh, this is missing or this isn't working right or I have to replace this piece. And I, I didn't know if they were being truthful or not. So I kind of just gave them their money back and moved on because how do you prove they're lying if you don't even know that much about the product? Right. And I know some people do like the disappearing ink and they write in the, you know, inside the battery compartments and all kinds of things to see. Cause I guess there's a lot of switching going on, but mm -hmm. for me, I just don't want to deal with that. I'd rather just refund somebody their money and move on. So yeah, it can be tricky. I mean, it's, irrita it's irritating, but yeah, that's true. But sometimes you have to go through that to figure out where the danger zone is. Like, okay, right. I'm doing that anymore. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right. I'll leave that to the experts. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so. do you want to talk about some things that you've sold over the years? Yeah, well, so I never got back to the recent when I decided to start reselling on a more on a continual basis because now I do it like every day. I do it part time because I do work full time. I do it very part time, but I was just I don't even know how. But again, that algorithm on on YouTube <laughs> uh -huh. sent, sent me one day to. I have no idea why it suggested a, this video, but somebody was doing an unboxing of a liquidation box. 
And I thought, oh, that looks interesting. So I clicked it on and I, that from there, I went down the rabbit hole and this lady, I still watch her to this day, but I was thinking some of the things in there, I'm like, people are going to buy that. <laughs> and then she'd come back with like her prices and this sold for this and this sold for this. And I'm like, what? Why would somebody buy that? They could just go to a Walmart and <laughs> purchase right. it or whatever. So I started thinking, you know, I, then that sent me to other people that were doing the, those unboxing. So I started watching more people. And then I thought, you know what, that, that looks like fun. That's something that's totally up my alley. So at first my thought was, I'm going to get all these liquidation boxes and I'm going to do Amazon. Well, right about that time, it, number one, I don't do things. I'm not somebody who jumps into something right away. I have to think about it and think about it. And I overthink things. So I overthought, you know, I spent, it took me two years <laughs> to start selling. But by that time, Amazon is pretty much over saturated and their policies started changing and not for the benefit of sellers yeah so I, I that's I, why I left yeah <laughs> and then also people started getting in trouble with some of these companies for selling on Amazon and not having the proper and it's not that you had to have like a, a wholesaler I don't know permit or permission I guess but you know, they're just protecting their product, some of them. So then, but then Amazon started coming after people for no reason. And I know eBay does to an extent, but I just thought, you know what? I don't think I want to deal with this. <laughs> so well, and thought, that's what happened to me. I um, got into the retail arbitrage and I use this example of coffee. I bought a whole bunch of some kind of coffee. I think it might've been Dunkin' Donuts pumpkin spice or something like at the end of the season and I was like oh you know it was marked down bought it cheap put it on Amazon and you know maybe had like I don't know 50 bags of it and then they would email this is not allowed this is not allowed you know the, the company whatever it was would they stopped allowing their products to be sold by third-party sellers on Amazon. And so you had all this inventory that yes. didn't sell. And so, I mean, the, the coffee had, I think, a two-year expiration. So guess what everybody got for Christmas the next year? <laughs> I made all these yes. gift baskets with that coffee, gave it to everybody. Like, I got to do something with it. But, um, and then especially with FBA, which is fulfillment by Amazon, if you shipped it in yes. stuff was in a warehouse and then something like this happened it kept happening over and over again this is not allowed and you had a whole right bunch of, and so then you had to pay to get it back or yeah. just and then you had to be gated them, yeah and you tell them be... or tell them to throw it away and it was just a lot of people lost their bleep in <laughs> doing fba because of that and it was it was very scary because you had spent all this money on inventory and then couldn't sell it there. You had to figure something else out. So that's why I went back to eBay and became like a cherry picker. It's like, I'm never doing that again because I just, yeah, I, I just decided I would, I decided I would dodge that bullet because then they started closing it. You had to be gated in this and you had to be gated in that. Gated, yeah. And then it just got stricter and stricter and what you could and couldn't sell. And then a lot of people were getting things returned because, well, number one, if you have liquidation, sometimes things look new and it's not. Mm -hmm. So you can get into trouble for that. Then Amazon has, um, they get first dibs basically. And then also I would, I understood that sometimes like when you send stuff in it, that's not necessarily your product that gets sent to somebody. It's, you know, you send it in as a new Gidget and somebody buys that Gidget and it's at another warehouse. It might be, an, you might get paid for it, but they're going to grab, they're just, I guess they just have areas. Yeah, it's like of, a big pool of so stuff. Maybe, and, and then maybe might, yours is perfect, but yeah. somebody else sent something in that's not. So yeah, it's like, no, I don't need that. <laughs> I don't need and that for the, the listeners, um, you said, they started gating categories, which right. made, um, in case people don't know what that means, um, you had to have special approval to sell in a category like groceries or toys or whatever it was. You couldn't just 
go on Amazon and start selling anymore. You had to have all this special approval. And some of us that were there a long time selling these products weren't approved to sell in those categories, um, whatever reason. And again, you have all this inventory, what are you gonna do with it? Um, so, and, and then what you're saying about selling a product, let's say you you have a, a Barbie brand new in the package and it's it's pristine, it's perfect, it sells, but they pull, you know, Joe Smith's Barbie to ship to the person because it's in a warehouse that's closer to that person, to the buyer. Right. And, you know, his packaging is not pristine. It's not perfect. And so the buyer gets it and complains, returns. You get the bad feedback. <laughs> yeah, you get the bad feedback because Amazon the pulled another item that was not identical to yours. And so it, it was too many hands in the business. Um, you know, you're basically turning your business over to the Amazon warehouse people. And I didn't like that at all. You know, you, you right. you've got too many hands in your business that have no skin in the game. They don't care. They're hourly employees. They're just pulling stuff and shipping it. And so that's what ruined my Amazon business. I just didn't like that. Yeah. You almost have to have a one-off, one-of-a-kind item they, right. that's so different. And I just... I just decided because I had already decided when I wanted to do this that I would also like, well, anything I can't that can't be put on Amazon, I'll just do eBay. So this was in 2017. I didn't start purchasing anything till 2019. Like it took me a couple of years. Like I said, I overthink things. And I remember <laughs> I, I remember <laughs> I really overthink. So I remember telling my husband, like that. I'm like, I have, I'm, I want to talk to you about some things. And he, he was like, oh no, <laughs> he thought it was, I sounded serious. And really all I wanted to tell him was I want to do this reselling thing and spend more time. And I wanted to do some uh, remodeling on the house. <laughs> but so we did the remodeling on the house, it, but the reselling, I just kept just not waiting, but just researching and researching. And so this is a lesson. You know what? You can research too much. Sometimes you just have to. <laughs> the you can over thing. research. Yeah. Beating a dead I am an over researcher. Kind of yeah. I am an over researcher. And I just do it. That's the, the hardest thing is starting for me. The hardest thing is starting. I'm a procrastinator. So I finally. And I was only working part time at this time, and then I wound up getting promoted, and now, and then I'm not only working full time but overtime and all kinds of stuff. By the time I started this, so I started just mostly selling on eBay, but then I did eventually branch out. So I do cross list to other platforms too. And eBay is my main jam, but I, I do sell quite a bit on some other platforms once in a while. Um, but again, I'm, it's, I'm very part-time. Well, so that's what brought me to <laughs> the present. And, you know, a lot of sellers are part-time. I reach out to people all the time to come on this podcast and I'm like, well, I don't really sell enough. And I really only do it part-time, but you know, they've been doing it 10 years or five years. And it's like, that means you're a seller. You're keeping up with it. And this podcast isn't about the biggest sellers and who sells the most. And it's, it's about the average everyday eBay seller that's working this into their life because life changes. You know, sometimes uh, you start off as a parent, you've got small kids and then 10 years later, they're grown and gone and your life is completely different. So yes. Yeah, so it, it is something you can come and go from at every station of life. Um, just based on what kind of time you have. So um, for the listeners, if you are approached to come on this podcast, don't feel like you have to be the biggest, most powerful seller out there because so many people from all walks of life do this and they they fit it in and they do it because they love it. You know, you love the yes, treasure. I love it. <laughs> you love selling that thing Fun. and shipping it and your customer's happy and um, it, it's not about the biggest out there. Um, and that's what I was kind of nervous about coming on because I'm definitely not a, like I said in my, my text, I'm not a high roller <laughs> seller by any means. I, you know, and my profits, 
you know, don't average, I'm not a hundred plus dollar seller because that's not what I find. Mm -hmm. But it also when I like research, cause I found you in that between, I don't know, 2017, 2018, somewhere in that before I started reselling. And I'm interested in those kinds of podcasts and YouTube channels and information. I want to see people who are just finding everyday average, what they call bread and butter items, because mm -hmm. that, that speaks to me. That's, that's what I find. That's, you know, what I can sell. And I, I think there's more of you than the ones that are like, oh, I sell a hundred items a day <laughs> and I have a warehouse and that's not the average seller. I yeah, can tell I'm you a, firsthand. That's not I'm a six figure seller. You and, know, and they are out there. It's but... like you make enough money to pay for a vacation. You make enough money to right. buy a new car or send your, uh, pay for your child's college so they don't have to take on student debt or remodel your house or take a break from your full time regular job to be a caregiver. There's all kind of reasons. And, you know, to right. And my reason, my reason is because. I'm so at this point, my husband's just a few years away from retirement. He's taking early retirement and I'm going with them and I, I won't be ready for retirement from my job yet, but I'm not <laughs> sticking around. So I knew we had to start planning and yes, we have, you know, our, our retirement funds in place and stuff, but that only goes so far and we don't know you know, what the future holds. So I wanted to start this and get it going as something that I could have, you know, for extra money when I retire, because we do like to travel and, not, you know, all that extra stuff that we just aren't sure what's going to happen. So, and in the meantime, I fell in love with it. So that's a plus plus. So that's, that's how I, I got started. with. Well, this. and I hear that a lot from my audience is people planning for retirement and you don't, especially with early retirement, you don't want to start dipping into your retirement funds. Oh, no. Early, you know, if you don't have to, because yes, we are in an uncertain economy. We don't know what's happening. So a lot of people are getting this set up, learning the business, and they don't really have time to jump into it yet because they've got three more years until they get their retirement package or whatever it is. And um, so you, you're in good company with, um, you know, getting it set up so you can do it as much as you want to or need to, um, in addition to your retirement money. And if if your husband is um, retiring early, he's not going to be eligible for Social Security for a while, maybe. Oh, no, not for a long, long time. Yeah. So we can't count on that either. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they've been telling me that since I was a kid, at least it's still here. <laughs> yeah. So now, it's like, you know, you I'm going to I'm gonna learn how to sell junk and make money on the side because nobody can take that away from you. Right. And that's going to be yours forever. That's not going right. to change. So, and at this point also I can, I can leave it. So sometimes I'll go, you know, gung ho and, and just start listing and doing all the things. And then I can stop it. I can put it on hold while I take a vacation because that's, I love to travel so, and then I can bring it back up and yes, it kind of takes a while and stuff, but I'm doing it you know, part-time so I can do that. Or if I, I, I work super early in the morning, I get up at 2.45. So oh. I get super tired when I get home and sometimes at work, I'll be like thinking about, oh, I could do this when I get home and that, and I can list this and I can take these photos and I get home and I'm just like, ah, oh. <laughs> and I wind up taking a nap or sleeping and sometimes I'll leave it for you know I can leave it on weeks on end and just sell as as the sales come in and then I can pick it up again so that's what's really nice about it can I ask you what kind of job you have that you have to get up so early um it's a government job okay all right well I <laughs> I don't even know I couldn't imagine having to have those hours and it's, yes it's and awesome. you know I don't have to but then it at the time I I started working I was like well what else am I gonna do kids were getting older and I don't want to just sit around of course I wasn't reselling then but um it, but it's been good to me so good okay well let's talk about some things you sold I started purchasing items in 2019 but I wasn't selling yet and then I started listing them like 
I want to say around October of that year. And I, I'm, I'm looking up on my other computer because I want to see how much I sold this item for. But there was this one item. And to date, I think it's my highest eBay sale. I've had other higher sales on other platforms, but I think this is my highest eBay sale. But I, so I started out, I was just going to do liquidation because I think it's fun. I love to open the boxes. It's like Christmas morning, opening up packages and stuff. But then I started going to thrift stores and that's like, well, that was fun too. That's like <laughs> Christmas morning too, I guess. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I had seen this, it was a coffee pot. It was a Nortaki coffee pot. I was looking at it and the original price, oh, here it is. Okay. The original price on it was, I want to say $7, but it was half off day. And it, so it was half off. Nobody had picked it up. People, I go straight for the breakables. I don't know why I love, I love breakable <laughs> things. I'm trying okay. to start. You can have all of them. <laughs> yes. Well, I don't know. There's just, of course you think. And at first I thought, oh, this is going to be worth something. And people are going to want this. And no, a lot of stuff people don't want. But this one, so I thought the same for this. So this was a Noritake coffee pot. And it had the lid. It's a, a porcelain coffee pot. And I know to look for Noritake because I have I have China that's Noritake. But this particular design I thought was meh. So I would not have paid $7 for it. However, it was half off day and I thought, well, $3.50, of course, you know, for $3.50, I'll take it. And I was thinking that maybe it'll bring 20, you know, maybe 25 if somebody's looking to add to their collection or whatever. So I purchased it and then there it sat in my closet. <laughs> now I have broken things before by letting them sit too long. And keep in mind, most of my items here, I have not listed. I have so much so there it sat for I want to say a couple a couple months maybe and then I thought you know what I need to get it off the floor let me go ahead and do I I use the google lens so I use my google lens to see what it was selling for and I saw a price of over a hundred dollars pop up and I was like what really <laughs> so off the floor the pot, a coffee pot came it's like oh yeah no this place is going somewhere safe until I had more time to research and so I I researched it and there was none listed some had sold for actually some had sold for even higher but I realized that the lid that went to it actually was a lid that went not to the coffee pot to like a sugar or creamer or something like that but it's it was still the same design so I wound I put it up and it sold in four days for $169 and that was a coffee pot I would not have picked up for seven dollars um now I had Noritake China when I got married back in 1988 uh, what was the pattern name um it's Colburn okay and it's just it was it wasn't one of the to me that like I have Nortaki and it's really pretty in a fruit pattern. This is just a kind of a old lady lace and flower pattern. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you could tell it's quality. You could tell it's quality, but I just didn't think because I'd seen others that were similar styles that only sold for maybe 20 or $30. So for three fifty, it was worth it. But apparently for $7, it was not. Yeah, but, I, but you never know when you're going to have the only one of something. Right. And then Maybe. I wasn't treating it very nicely because I thought, well, you know, not that I, I didn't want to. I just wasn't being super careful. So then after but that, I, mean, I was like, oh, no, this is getting listed. And there might it, be two or three out there and then no sell. And then yours is the only one. So right. Yeah. That's it was, why you, you have to realize, OK, I'm going to price it accordingly. And at some point, mine might be the only one and there's your sale. Yeah, well, it sold in four days. And then the lady who purchased it sent me a really, really sweet message after she got it. She was so, so thankful. Apparently, it was her mother's set and she was at adding to the set. 
So okay. her mother had passed away. And so she had inherited her mother's set and she had been looking for this for quite a while. So it was, it was a win-win. I made good money and, and, you know, she got something that she cherished. So that was, that's a great, story. exciting for yeah. me. Yeah. And it was right, you know, just a, oh no, maybe it was about a year, a little over a year after I started reselling on a more consistent basis. So yeah, and so you were drawn to that item and it 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 worked out, you know? It worked out. Um, yeah. And I'm not one I I'm I don't shy away from shipping. I don't mind. <laughs> so far, oh knock on wood, I haven't had anything break, but I'm probably an over packer, maybe. <laughs> hey, I don't think you can be when it's something delicate like that. Right. Well, to see the way that the post office and not just the post office, but any postal carriers uh, treat some of the packages, you have to be. And I know there's a thing out there with people saying that they feel like when they put fragile stickers on the boxes that it, those items tend to be roughed up. Well, that's true. I used to work with a guy <laughs> who, he, he wasn't a great coworker. He told me a story. He, th he thought it was funny. He used to work for a, a postal carrier, not not the post office, but a different one. And he said, oh, every time a, a box came in that had fragile, we would we would shove it and we would throw it and we would like <laughs> jump on it. And I was I was mortified. I was like, oh, my gosh, how could you do that? Because he thought I was going to laugh with him. And I'm like, that's terrible. And he was like, oh, well, it wasn't me. It was my coworker. Of course like, not. No, you yeah, just told me it was you. So that's a true story. And I'm not saying most of them or all of them are like that. But, you know, that's the mindset of some. Yeah, I've heard that my entire eBay career. That well, I don't put fragile, fragile on anything. Putting fragile on your package is an invitation to exactly. have it treated like a football, you know, and <laughs> kicked and thrown and um I've heard this enough. Yeah, all it takes is that it. one person. So, and most of them, I think, treat treat them, you know, as well as they can. But they're still, you know, they're still tossing and they're in a hurry to meet deadlines and all that. So mm -hmm. I I do pack a lot. <laughs> okay. There. So that was a happy ending. Um, what that else was, do you yeah. have on your list? I have to say, like, so where I live, and I know I, I hear over and over over how wonderful Texas is to source in. Well, not where I live. <laughs> um, I don't, we don't, my city has over 250,000 residents that are counted. Uncounted, we probably have about 500,000, and we only have maybe four thrift stores. Mm -hmm. People just aren't that generous here, I guess. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of places to source. So I have to either source here. I'll go to San Antonio every once in a while. That's a couple hours away. And when I get out of town, I'll go places. But in the meantime, I also do the liquidation boxes and things like that. I guess right now the boxes are, everything's going up. Like everything's getting popular. People are I think overpaying for some stuff, but it is what it is. But so I have several boxes that I just jumped right into, purchased. And I don't recommend that if you don't have the money to lose. Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> so a gamble. Yeah. It's a it's a gamble. I and a gamble I'm willing to try, but I also have my uh, you know, we're fine financially. So I have my other job to fall back on. So it's not many that I'd be very upset if I lost it. However, I I do have the leeway to try different things out. So I'm not afraid to try different things out. You Some of them, you know kind of what you're getting and some of them you don't know at all. I paid $216.20 for the box. And it was a box that came all shoes and all the shoes that came were all from Target. They're all Target returns. And they don't tell you like where it's from or anything until you get it. So I know Target returns are popular. So the shoes, a lot of them were just multiples of the same thing, which I know a lot of people love because you can do one listing. However, I thought 
several of I thought they were kind of ugly. So I, I was like, oh boy, I'm never gonna, who wants all these shoes? I'm never gonna sell them. And things do take a while, you know, you're not gonna sell everything off, but I have to say that I did sell everything in the entire box finally. I think this year I had two shoes left this year. And I made $748.46 on the box. So that's great. So that was a profit of about $450. And again, it's not something that you're going to have right away, but it's kind of those bread and butter sales. They just, you know, every once in a while, they keep coming in. And one thing I've also learned is when they do those boxes, they go out to a lot of people, a lot of sellers get the same things. Right. So when you go to a list, <laughs> there's a ton of the same thing on there. And if you just wait it out, eventually the other sellers are going to be out of their inventory and then your start selling. So right. some things I haven't even listed. So that was all just, just shoes from Target. Nothing well, I was super were special. Gonna, I thought you were going to talk about what happened to me when I bought a liquidation palette of shoes this was back when all <laughs> started like in I don't know 2010 to 2012 so I, I tried everything for this business I was like I'm gonna try this and this is what yeah I'm, I'm like you I'll try it <laughs> um so I went in with a friend and we bought this um it was a Gaylord of shoes which is like the the big giant cardboard thing they put pumpkins in you know it's, it's that big it's it's big. yes so yeah all the shoes were in there and they were, um, I don't know if they were store returns or what, they, they weren't new, but so we sorted everything out and there would be like one shoe of something and there would be, you know, two left feet of something, <laughs> all these odds and ends that didn't match. So a lot of it was waste. Um, yeah, you can list one shoe for like an amputee person that only needs one shoe but when you've got this giant container of shoes and so many odds and ends that don't match up it, it was it was pretty disappointing and of course you can't return it right <laughs> our liquidation is you just pay for it and you get what you get so that was one thing that didn't go right and then um we lost money on that. And then I did another one that was, um, it was just all kinds of odds and ends from BJ's Wholesale. I don't know if you have that there. No. It, it's like Costco or Sam's. It's a, a buying club, you know, where prices are cheaper. So we got all these things in there. And one of them was water filters that you screw on to your faucet in the kitchen. Okay. Those <laughs> oval looking things. And so- Oops that's going so they were a lot of the packages were open so I tested one and the thing just exploded <laughs> I'm surprised it didn't hit me in the face and I was like oh god now I've got all these defective that's a lawsuit waiting to happen yeah I was like I got all these defective water filters I can't sell these I'm going to, someone's going to be injured and that's going to be the end of me, you know, and I don't want somebody to be injured and I don't want to sell a crappy product. So I got, um, I was very discouraged with liquidation. They probably do it differently now. Um, well, it depends on the company too. You have to be really careful. And I had done my research and I made sure I bought, um, ones that were manifested or at least partially, they don't necessarily tell you exactly what you're getting, but you know, like, like they're like, brand new shoes and they'll give samples and stuff and and some things are gonna like I've had hair ties and stuff too so it's like that's not gonna make me profit but I'll still sell it you know because every little bit coming in helps right. I, I have a I still have some right now I haven't even listed the whole box and I've had it for a couple of years but at this point I like I I, I think I showed one yesterday on the money making Monday I only got five bucks for it but I'm already in the profit, almost $150 on the box. So everything from here on out is profit. I do assign like an average cost of goods to everything, but you know, I'll still sell for just a few dollars at most of the time I have buyer pay shipping, except for a few things like now this is, I have makeup. I decided I'd try makeup 
and the makeup was pristine and stuff, but boy, it is not a money maker. And I am just struggling just to make my money back at this point. So that that's a no, no for me. That was a lesson like, no, because you can't really sell one lipstick or one lip gloss you know, with the way that the shipping costs. Right. You know, you have to kind of lock them up. Well, yes. The profit on that when you lock them up is it's just not that great. You're see in your situation, time is your most valuable asset right now. You don't have time to hit the streets and go to all these estate sales and garage sales and, and just a lot of looking when you're a reseller. And sometimes it's not a lot of finding. Right. So that you you don't have time to waste right now because you've got this full-time job and everything. So liquidation, you can do that from your computer you don't have to leave your house and right and it's so fun <laughs> yeah you're that's still, the you're still hunting. Um, that's the attraction for a lot of people with buying stuff online whether it's box lots on auction sites or you know for whatever reason you don't have time to get out there and do the cherry picking one by one thing and um, I talk about caregivers a lot and I'm seeing that um, firsthand with my sister right now just she just doesn't have time to do anything you know, your life changes, you, you get to different stations in life where you, you have more time than other times in your life. But um, I think that's the attraction to, you know, even going on eBay and buying lots, you know. Like, yeah. And I've done that uh, too. Um, like I got into cards and, you know, big lots of things that are estate sale leftovers that you can then open that and then sift through it and, List what and I want. love sifting through things. And, and the one thing with the liquidation boxes, those things, they're very easy and not very time consuming to take photos of. They're very easy to list to get the information off of. So that's a plus in that I'm not going to sell makeup anymore, though. But I, I and talking about eBay and stuff. So I've been to different sites and I've, I've purchased several of the estate jewelry that they sell in some people just lot them up and sell them in huge lots. Yes. I, and I part them out and I've actually done very well with that. I have a lot though, but some of it's junk. And so all the junk I'll put aside. And then I've had a few boxes where I just put it into a small flat rate box, put 15. I mean, most people sell it for more, but I'll just put 15 bucks on it plus shipping. And those have been really popular. I make sure to, list that it's junk you know and, and like we don't know what's in here good luck yeah well no, I just say that it's junk this is like the scraps is junk for just craft making or or whatever but I don't want anybody to think that they're going to get anything that's great because I've already picked all the good stuff right out. you picked through it but still so you buy a giant lot and then you sift through it and then you make smaller lots from that big one and then resell that. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. But, and then also individually. So I've had some really good um, things. Like I've had a couple of bracelets. One sold for, I want to say around $75 that came out of one of those boxes. And probably, I, I probably paid 30 bucks for everything. Wow. Hundreds of pieces. So I don't think I have more than a dollar if you were to have you know do an average cost of goods I don't have more than a dollar probably less on every item mm -hmm. so I want to say one bracelet and then another one sold for around 50 or 60 dollars and one thing you do you look up to see like if it's silver in the back and and sometimes it's just the designer mm -hmm. and and I, so I did listen to your podcast that had the uh, what people were talking about the different jewelry makers and stuff. So that was helpful because I'm just learning. I've, I've had this stuff for a while, but I still don't know much. I really have to look everything up. So that, that is a little more time consuming, but it can be really profitable. I've already made, made my money back with, with those items. Yeah. Some and of it's those, fun. It's, um, estate jewelry lots have like 500 pieces in them. You know, they're really, large there's a lot of stuff and if you think about okay if you run an estate sale company um some of them i'm sure most of them have a, a contact for their leftovers but um 
it, sometimes there's just so much jewelry. If, if you ever into an estate sale and it was a jewelry person, um, I went to one recently and just every single room, there was just boxes and boxes of all this costume jewelry. Like, did the lady have a shopping problem or did she actually wear all this or did she inherit it from somewhere or something? Was, yeah, I always wonder those things. It was so much, so... But anyway, um, well, we are getting to the end here. So um, you chose the question about what book you're reading. I do mostly audiobooks now because I can list and I can take pictures and do all that while I'm listening. But it's yes, called great for um, keeping you company and time savings it's like yes yeah and that's I why like I like podcasts too I like them when I'm driving or just working around you know cleaning and stuff because you're it's like you're reading but you're accomplishing something else too <laughs> yeah so it's called the Thomas Berryman number okay and like I said I just started it so I don't know if it's going to be any good but I tend to like mysteries and murder books <laughs> yeah his stuff is good his stuff is good his, I've read a lot of stuff is good books. yeah James Patterson and that he started teaming up with several of the writers now but I don't really have a lot to say about it because I just downloaded it and I just started the first chapter so it, it's really hard but I think it's a newer book that came out of his okay well this has been very informative I think you have shared a lot of tips for people who are working full time, how to get inventory, or for whatever reason, if you just can't get out. Um, a lot of disabled people sell on eBay and they can't get out to shop and go places as much as they would like. Um, you got your caregivers, you've got um, just busy people, or you don't have great thrift stores or sales around you. You can find stuff online to buy and flip. So yeah. Thanks for sharing the pros and cons of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not all roses, but yeah, you there is a, an element of risk, but it's calculated risk. You know, you're not buying things completely sight unseen. You kind of know what you're getting and, no. and that sort of thing. I was just looking that bracelet actually sold for $150. Wow, why did I think it sold for 70 or 75? I don't know, okay. but for you. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Okay, well, we will end on that note. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on and we will look for your sales on the Facebook group. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, bye. It. All right, bye-bye. Thanks so much, Melissa, for joining me and sharing so much fantastic information. On to today's trivia question. Melissa mentioned retail arbitrage. And I thought, well, maybe some people don't know what that means. What exactly is arbitrage? Here's a few seconds to think it over. The word arbitrage originates from a Latin root arbitrari, which means to give judgment. So the actual definition of arbitrage comes from the financial world. It means the nearly simultaneous purchase and sale of securities or foreign exchange in different markets in order to profit from price discrepancies. So I'll give you the Suzanne definition. You're basically taking something from one market and selling it in another market where you can sell it for more money. This has been going on since the dawn of time. <laughs> so retail arbitrage is the practice of taking advantage of a price difference between two or more markets, or in other words, reselling. An example would be finding a product at Walmart that sells for a dollar, maybe it's on clearance, purchasing that product, and then reselling it online, Amazon, eBay, wherever you want to resell it for more than you bought it for and making a profit. So now you know what retail arbitrage means. Okay, next week, Shelly is my guest, and she specializes in selling Disney items. 
She lives very close to Disney in Florida and just has a wealth of information to share. And I didn't even know the conversation was going to go there. She just started talking about all these things. And so (laughs) that's what happens on these podcasts. It's just organic conversation. So make sure you tune in for that episode. And thank you, listeners, for spending your time listening to my podcast. I hope everyone has an amazing week on eBay. Bye for now.